الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة على المصطفى وعلى آله وصحبته ومن اهتدى بهديه إلى يوم اللقاء وبعد So Allah Rabbul Azza created the entirety of the creation and from the entirety of the creation Allah Rabbul Azza honored, selected, preferred and chose humankind so they say, Inna Allah astafa min al khalqi bani Adam. From the entirety of the creation, Allah Rabbul Azza selected the progeny of Adam, humankind. Thumma astafa min bani Adam al anbiya. And then from the millions of humans that came and went, Allah Rabbul Azza selected, chose, preferred, honored, exalted the prophets. And in that regard, He Azza wa Jal sent 124,000 prophets. Then from this galaxy of prophets, Allah Rabbul Azza then chose, selected, honored, preferred, exalted the Rusul the messengers who were prophets but with a book or a new sharia then from amidst these select individuals the rusul allah rabbul azza selected five as the greats amidst the messengers and chronologically they are nuh ibrahim Musa, Isa, and Muhammad sallallahu alayhim ajma'in. Five men, the like of which the world has never seen nor will ever see. Imagine amidst them is Isa, Jesus, who would Get a lump of clay, make it into the shape of a bird and blow on it and it would fly away. He would go to the dead and summon it, rise and the dead would rise by the permission of Allah Rabbul Azza. A one that spoke in the cradle, Isa alayhi salam. In amidst them is Musa, the Kaleem of Allah, the Prophet given the distinction to have an exclusive direct communication with his Lord without any interpreter or medium in between. And yet from these exceptional men, extraordinary men or extraordinary men, when Allah Rabbul Azza chose a friend, He Azza wa Jal chose Ibrahim and Muhammad as friends. So today I want to talk to you about the friend of Allah Rabbul Azza, the friend of the Dhul Arsh al-Majid and Fa'al al-Lima Yurid, Ibrahim alayhi salam. And Ibrahim alayhi salam is mentioned in the Quran many times. And in the 73 places that Allah Rabbul Azza talks about this friend of his, any time you read it, you can't help but notice that there is a special affection, a special love and relationship between the Creator and this Ibrahim alayhi salam. And it's no secret why. Allah Rabbul Azza says, وَإِذِ ابْتَلَى إِبْرَاهِيمَ رَبُّهُ بِكَلِمَاتٍ فَأَتَمَّهُنْ Any time Allah Rabbul Azza chose to test, try Ibrahim with certain tasks and certain missions and certain goals. Ibrahim always perfected and, and excelled in all the tests. And the tests of this Ibrahim didn't start, you know, when he was in his 30s or 40s or his tests started at a very tender young age. So Allah Rabbul Azza says, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا إِبْرَاهِيمَ رُشْدَهُ مِنْ قَبْلِ وَكُنَّا بِهِ عَالِمِينَ 
we gave Ibrahim advancement of thought and logic, depth of understanding, clarity of belief at a very young age, and we were ever aware of him. So can you imagine this child, Ibrahim, infant, opening his eyes into this world, being born and surrounded by pagan disbelief. You know, idol worship, image worship, superstitions, and so on. And yet he is a visionary amidst the ordinary, a man that can see you and the rest are blind, a genius amidst simple men. So he can see the faults and flaws in this very early on. And scholars say at the age of six and seven, he had already grown disdain for the idols. So he used to ask his dad. And to make matters worse, his dad was a fashioner of idols. Like the family business was to make idols and sell idols. So in this household, Ibrahim starts to look at these idols and, uh, you know, questions their validity. And once that happens, you know, the natural next step is to start to look, who is my Lord? Who is my creator? And Ibrahim alayhi salam introspected, pondered, searched, reflected, and eventually reaches the conclusion, إِنِّي وَجَّهْتُ وَجْهِيَ لِلَّذِي فَطَرَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ حَنِيفًا وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ My Lord cannot be these stones. It can't be that star, nor can it be that moon, nor can it be that blazing, scorching sun. Rather, my Lord is the one that created it all. So to him, I turn an absolute monotheism. And Ibrahim, through the intellect that Allah Rabbul Izza had given him, the heart that Allah Rabbul Izza had blessed him with, uh, found his Lord and found it with a great deal of conviction. And when that happens, when the heart finds its master, when you finally realize who your creator is, then looking around at people who are worshiping stones and images, there is a huge, you know, what are you doing question. So Ibrahim started, you know, the discussion, the conversations. What are these images that you show such reverence and devotion to? Uh, and they had no reason. You know, simple men like compared to who Ibrahim was and his intellect. So the best they could do is say, we saw our fathers do this, so we are doing it. And Ibrahim, at this stage, he's, the Quran refers to him as Fata. So at this stage, Ibrahim alayhi salam in that relative youth, makes this proclamation لَقَدْ كُنْتُمْ أَنْتُمْ وَآبَاؤُكُمْ فِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ Verily you are yourselves and your fathers before you in manifest error. You were wrong, your forefathers were wrong. And friction starts to build and frustration in Ibrahim to make the point that listen a stone that you fashioned with your own hand cannot be something that uh, has created you and rules you and manages you and nourishes you and cherishes you and something that you need to revere and be devoted to and whose wrath you need to fear and whose pleasure you need to seek uh, 
So Ibrahim alayhi salam thinking of ways to get this point to their heads eventually came up with a plan. And the plan unfolded like this. So there was a day uh, amidst the people of his time where they would have a, a you know, festivity, a festival, and everyone would leave the town and go to the outskirts and there they would have uh, their festivities. And so I can imagine the excitement as people are getting ready and prepared and they come to Ibrahim, let's go. So Ibrahim says, Inni saqeem, I am unwell, uh, I am sick. So they left and in the whole of the town, it's just Ibrahim left. So when everyone had left, Ibrahim alayhi salam went to the temple where the idols are stacked, where the idols are displayed. And idols are usually designed in a way to have some kind of a psychological effect on on the masses. Uh, so I can imagine it, you know, big idols, small idols, um, different, sh different looks, uh, different themes. And Ibrahim enters the temple. And as is the tradition, they usually bring their offerings, simple men, to these stones out of fear, fear that my child might die of sickness and business don't go down the drain and all those normal things. So he sees in front of them offerings and he sees them uh, standing in full display. Uh, and yet the wisdom, the ability to be able to see you when no one else seems to be able to see you. And he looks at the food and he asks, why aren't you eating? Why don't you talk and why don't you hear? And no response. So Ibrahim alayhi salam picks up an axe and starts smashing these idols. The Quran says, فَجَعَلَهُمْ جُذَاذًا إِلَّا كَبِيرًا لَهُمْ لَعَلَّهُمْ إِلَيْهِ يَرُجِعُونَ So Ibrahim shattered them into bits and then got the axe and hung it on the neck of the biggest idol that he hadn't touched and then went. So at night or in the afternoon, the people came back and they go to the temple and oh, you're all shattered. The gods. So they said, Man fa Who has done this to our idols, to our gods? Who has done this to the stones in whose hands we put our livelihood? So they said, Inna sami'na fatan yadhkuruhum yuqalu lahu Ibrahim. We heard of a young lad talking about them. His name is Ibrahim. So go get him, bring him here to the eyes of the people. You know, there's something's got to happen. There's anger, there is confusion, there's delusion, what to do. So they brought Ibrahim and Ibrahim. Ah, may the blessings of the Lord be upon you, ya Ibrahim. Young, young lad. And he comes, visualize it. There's a court, a town hearing if you like. And this is not a 40 year old man. This is a young lad holding his own. So he comes standing and they ask him, أَأَنْتَ فَعَلْتَ هَذَا بِآلِهَتِنَا يَا Ibrahim." Or Ibrahim, did you do this to our lords, to our gods? And the wisdom, the wisdom of Ibrahim, he said, 
بل فعله كبيرهم هذا no that big ones done it فاسألوه ask him إن كانوا ينطقون if they can speak you see I am in education and uh, I deal with young people and wisdom, intellect, logic, so penetrating that leaves you dumbfounded. Like this logic of Ibrahim. Says, no, that one did it. The axe is on his neck. His competition is all gone and broken. So he's done it. But then ask him if he can speak. Now all of a sudden the realization sinks in. And they turn to themselves. And they say introspectively. Because Allah knows what the heart says. Allah knows what man whispers to himself in the depths of his soul. So Allah narrates that side to us as well. So he says, they said to themselves, you are, you are the wrongdoers. You are oppressors. Like you've oppressed yourselves and the people with these fake beliefs. But prejudice has die hard and they have to say face. So they say, لَقَدْ عَلِمْتَ مَا هَؤُلَاءِ يَنْطِقُونَ Ibrahim, you know they can't speak. What a confession to come out in court to say, our God can't speak. Like what type of God can be associated with the word can't? You know, my God can't speak. That Allah, Habibi, you're better than him, you can speak. So Ibrahim says, أُفِّلْ لَكُمْ وَلِمَ تَعْبُدُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ Woe be unto you! Then why do you worship them instead of the Creator? Why do you worship them instead of Allah Rabbul Izzah? So to save face and to satisfy their egos and to continue in the blindness in which they found themselves. So they said, قَالُوا حَرِّقُوهُ Burn him! وَانْصُرُوا آلِهَتَكُمْ And support your idols and your deities and the broken gods. So they started collecting firewood and fuel. And they amassed the whole huge pile. So that they could make an example of Ibrahim and satisfy the pains of their hearts. Far away from logic. And the scholars of Tafsir say they created a semi-hill and they put trenches under it and so that air can flow and the rest of the engineering requirements for a big fire. And then they burnt this fire and blazing so hot that if a bird flew over it, it would be dead and baked and down and gone. So fire like that, you can't come near because fire radiates in all directions. So heat, you can't walk near it. So they brought a, a catapult to chuck Ibrahim into the fire. And the young lad is sitting on the catapult, tied to be thrown into the depths of this hill. Fire scorching, can't come near it. There, Ibrahim alayhi salam, some narration say, Jibreel comes to him. Says, Ibrahim, do you need my help? The angel Jibreel. So he says, Hasbi Allahu wa ni'mal wakil. My Lord is enough for me, the best disposer of my affairs. So the catapult got released and Ibrahim is going. And all the while, the sovereign master of creation watches, aware of everything. So Allah Rabbul Izza mid-flight commands to the fire, Ya Nar, O fire, Kuni Barda, become cool. 
Yet coolness would have frozen Ibrahim because the Lord commands become cool, you will become cold. So Allah Rabbul Izza puts a conditional clause for the safety Ibrahim, of Ibrahim. وَسَلَامٌ عَلَىٰ Ibrahim, And become an abode of peace for Ibrahim. So Ibrahim landed in the fire, stayed in the fire, the fire subsided. Ibrahim eventually walked out and the hair on his head isn't burnt. And he lived a good long life, good long life. And they asked him in the latter days of his life, they said, Ibrahim, what was the best days of your life? He said, when I was in the fire. Because they, Allah Rabbul Izza had commanded it to be an abode of peace. So the peace and serenity that Ibrahim felt they hadn't felt anywhere outside of there. Uh, and then obviously when he comes out unscathed, the news of this goes far and wide. Like a young lad broke all the idols. They burnt him, walked out. So the king summoned him. And young lad, young lad. So he went to the court of the king. And you see on TV the pomp and ceremony of the courts of kings. So Ibrahim entered the court of the king. And the king decides to argue with him about his lord. So responding, Ibrahim says, Rabbi alladhi yuhyi wa yumeet. My Lord is the one that gives life and takes life. You see, Allah alone gives life. Like, we were made from the earth, the elements, those basic chemicals. What gave that life and made it into living cells and the cells multiplied? That Allah gives life. Allah takes life. So the king in his <coughs> feebleness said, Ana uhyi wa umit. I give life and I take life. Let me show you. So he summoned two prisoners, commanded the soldier, kill this one, let this one live. So he said, see, I gave life, I took life. And obviously, it's it's silly demonstration of understanding because you didn't give life to him. You just decided to execute this one. His life was given by someone else. But Ibrahim is too big a man to get involved. And he knows that in your heart of hearts, you've already understood my point. But I will, uh, and this is why, this is why the Quran says he had advancement of thought and heart and understanding and wisdom and clarity. So Ibrahim alayhi salam changes tactics. So he says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْتِي بِالشَّمْسِ مِنَ الْمَشْرِقِ فَأْتِي بِهَا مِنَ الْمَغْرِقِ My Lord is the one that brings the sun out from the east. You go bring it out from the west. The Quran فَبُحِتَ الَّذِي كَفَرُ the one who was in denial, in rejection, was flabbergasted. What's he going to do with the sun? Human, you could do this little uh, game done. So Ibrahim alayhi salam preached to his people to the level he could. And eventually they chased him out. And the rest of his life, he's an, an immigrant, a muhajir of a prophet going from place to place and city to city, preaching the word of Allah and living a life of obedience to Allah Rabbul Izza. Then old age came and Ibrahim still doesn't have any children. 
it's himself and his wife. So now an old man, 80 plus, close to 90, um, he makes this dua. He says, Rabbi habli min as-salihin. O Lord, give me a righteous one, a righteous son who will inherit prophethood after me, who will teach people the way to their Lord. So as soon as the utterance comes, Jibreel comes, this فَبَشَّرْنَاهُ بِغُلَامٍ حَلِيمٍ we gave him the glad tidings of a forbearant son, like a son who is willing to forbear and suffer. And can you imagine almost 90 and finally a son is born to your house, finally a light in your house. Finally, laughter and giggles running around your house. Uh, you know, the coolness of his eyes, the light of his heart, the joy of his old age, the fruit of the summer of his youth. Finally, a son. And the son is still an infant. And Ibrahim gets commanded by his Lord. Now, Ibrahim. Take the son and your wife and travel far to the land of Bakka, current Mecca, and there leave them in a dry, desolate, unvegetated valley and come back. Do you see the tests of Ibrahim? So Ibrahim alayhi salam took this young child who only a father of that age will be able to know the type of link, the type of bond, the type of attachment, the type of love that a father that old will have to a child that young. All fathers love their children. But ask the one that doesn't have children until his latter days and Allah blesses him with one. That's a different ball game. And yet Ibrahim alayhi salam takes little Ismail and their mom and his mom, Ismail's mom, Hajar alayhi salam. And they go traveling. Uh, until they reach this valley in a rocky mountainous area where for miles on end there's no vegetation in sight, not a little green blade under which to shade, no water, no sign of life. And once they reach the place shown to him by God, he disembarks and they get off. And he leaves them a little water bag and some dates. And then takes his mount and walks off. So she looks at him. Hajar alayhi salam. Says, Ibrahim, where are you going? Silent. And just keeps walking. The sentiments of, of a father, of a loving husband. Maybe, maybe eye contact would have made him cry. Maybe he didn't want to show that face. He just kept walking. So she asks again, Ibrahim, where are you going? To whom are you leaving us? Why are you leaving us? And as she you know, rushes after him, chases after him. Eventually it clicked. So she says, Allahu amaraka bihada. Ibrahim, has your Lord commanded you to do this? So he nodded a little. So she said, go. Allah won't forsake us. 
Allah won't let us go to waste. If he has commanded, then he will look after everything. So Ibrahim rode out a little until he was out of sight and then stopped and turned towards the heavens with this dua. Rabbana inni askantu min dhurriyyati biwadin ghayri dhi zar'in inda baytika al-muharram. O Lord, I have left my progeny in an unvegetated valley where there is no vegetation in sight for miles on end, no drop of water, no sign of life. I have left them there so that they can establish prayer in this section of the world. O oh Lord, so turn the hearts of men towards them. So he went. And there, little Ismail, the water runs out pretty quick. And this few dates they had ran out. And panic settles in. And the young mom sees the child cry and there's nothing to give him. The heat has dried up her own milk. And she runs up towards the Mount de Safa looking for some sign of life, looking for a bit of water, looking for help. And then she'd run back and up the mountain Marwa, looking for some water, some life, some food, some help, someone. And again, in that anxiety up and down. And the child is in the valley down the bottom, crying. And again, the Lord knows and the Lord watches. So Allah Rabbul Izza sent Jibreel, go strike at the foot of Ismail and let a water gush out that will flow till Qiyamah come. So Jibreel struck at the, near the foot of Ismail and a water gushed forth. Zamzam, the one you go and drink when you're in Hajj and the one you bring endless bottles with back home and the one that has been feeding the thirsty since the times gone by. So water came and our mother tried to collect the water and a little spring formed. And birds started to see that there's water, so they circle around it. Travelers saw the birds, so they said there must be water here, and they came. And when they come, they see this lone woman, regal woman, by herself, in the middle of nowhere. No sign of travel, no sign of amal, just by herself, sitting in a serenity befitting the wife of a prophet, confident in the mission that her Lord has given her, confident in his protection, confident in the care that is being afforded to her, confident that she has the backing of the one above the heavens with a little child. So they come and her personality presence is powerful enough that fully grown tribesmen have come and they feel that they need her permission to settle here. So they say, can we settle here? She said, you can, but the water is mine. So she grows, she stays with them. Young Ismail grows with them, plays with their kids. And uh, time passes, he becomes a young lad himself now. And now, and I think about it far away from this scene. Ibrahim must remember night and day, the son and the wife and what has become of them. And he must pray for them. 
all fathers do. And now, years later, he sees a dream. He sees a dream that he is slaughtering that son that has now grown up. And dreams of prophets or commands of Allah, different to the dreams of a common man. So Ibrahim set out again to the city of, to the valley of Mecca. And he comes and now sees Ismail, young lad, handsome, for different reasons, but it is sufficient to say that he is the grandfather of our Prophet. So seeing his son, he says, Ya Bunay, my dear son, I have seen in a dream anni adbahuk, that I am slaughtering you. Fanbur madha tara. Then see what is your opinion, what is your verdict, what do you say? This is a son he hasn't seen for years. This is a son who hasn't seen this father since the days of infancy. And yet his response is phenomenal. He says, Ya Abati Fa'alma Tu'mar, my dear father, do as you have been commanded. Satajiduni, you will find me, insha'Allah, by the will of Allah, min sabirin from those who will be patient. How did you grow up like that, O Ismail? Like, you haven't seen your father since infancy. Who taught you devotion like this? Who taught you obedience like this? Who taught you faithfulness like this? Who taught you piety like this? That single mother that he grew up with. Dear ones, I talk about the power of a mother. Here you see it, the power of a mother. He could have been brought up a bitter child. Your father forsook you, your father left you. Uh, he could have become a very vindictive child. He could, but instead, she brings him up to be this. And had he been anything less, we wouldn't have known about him in history. And today we boast and rejoice um, in him being the ancestor of our Prophet. And in that way, we make our chain to him. Ismail alayhi salam. So, Ibrahim takes and look at the test of a father, which father can sacrifice a son. So he takes the young lad and knife in hand to go fulfill the command of the Lord. And when he reaches the place where he intends to sacrifice him, Ismail says, Father, put my face on the floor like so that you don't see the expressions on my face when you pull the knife lest your hand tarry out of a fatherly love and the command of the Lord be delayed so the Quran says فَلَمَّا أَسْلَمَا when they had both surrendered to the command of the Lord and had faced him towards the ground as in his forehead was on the ground and knife in hand and he wants to pull Nadayna, we called out to him Ayya Ibrahim that O oh Ibrahim Qad ru'ya. you have fulfilled your dream you have passed the test Allah doesn't want the blood of your child we were testing the piety of your heart and they sent him وَفَدَيْنَاهُ بِذِبْحٍ عَظِيمٍ And instead of your son, sacrifice this ram instead. And that is the tradition that is left for us every Eid al-Adha. We sacrifice in 
following the footsteps of our father Ibrahim alayhi salam. Um, so Ibrahim alayhi salam, the man who was kicked out of his own city, the man that was thrown in the fire and alienated uh, by his own family, now has his son and Allah will give him another son, Ishaq, and both of these will come great nations and each one sees it as an honor and a privilege and a great prestige that our forefathers can be traced back to Ibrahim, the friend of Allah. There are many, many lessons to learn. But dear ones, um, a lot of times we get disenfranchised by society because of what we believe in. And um, at times a son turns to righteousness and parents might find it difficult to accept them. Um, you feel, you know, alienated, alone, segregated, separated from family. But bear it as Ibrahim did with goodness and with kindness and with piety. And Allah Rabbul Izzah won't let you go to waste. Um, so this is the story or some parts of the story of our father Ibrahim. May Allah Rabbul Izzah resurrect us with the Prophet and with Ibrahim alayhi salam. May he give us the joy of laying eyes on them. And